I guess we're so nervous. Yeah, so I, I screwed up the house. No, I screwed so. it all up. <laughs> Toy. Were we like? I guess we're so nervous. Can we like play together? Hello, I'm Hana Junkwon. I'm Jeonjong. I'm Hana Junkwon. I'm Jeonjong. Hana Junkwon. I'm Jeonjong. 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 I'm 네, 이 질문의 답을 얻기 위해 반가운 분을 다시 모시게 되었는데요. 6개월 만입니다. 인텔, 엔비디아, TSMC, 마이크론텍, AMD를 커버하고 있는 웨드부시의 매트 프라이스입니다. 매튜, 안녕하세요. Hi, Matt. It's good to have you back on our channel. How have you been? Uh, I've been awesome and it's great to be here. Thank you. First, to start off with Intel, uh, with, in, with regard to the $5 billion investment from NVIDIA, what are the key synergies that uh, Intel is expecting with the partnership with NVIDIA? Also, uh, Intel has approached Apple for investment. Do you think there were any government policy uh, incentives playing in this kind of processes? With Intel, the, the real benefit they get is the funding, right? I, I, Intel's been struggling a bit with cash. Uh, this gives them $5 billion. For NVIDIA, however, there isn't much in the near term. It takes two to three years to, to develop a product. I think the real benefit for NVIDIA is, is the political benefit. So it's not necessarily that there's anything that the U.S. government's offering, but it, there's an understanding that you are supporting the U.S. government's goals. I, I think in, in the same vein with, with Apple, um, that's what they're getting uh, or would get from a potential investment in Intel, is they would get uh, goodwill from the U.S. government, which is really important these days given uh, all the shifts in U.S. policy. Um, as you know, in large semiconductor market, uh, it's often characterized as winner-takes-all environment. Um, how do you see, how do you view Intel's prospect in such markets? I think Intel has a lot to prove. So the, the company is behind on its fab efforts, it's behind on its chip design efforts, and so they need to rectify those, those issues. Uh, that's going to take time. Uh, so I, I think 18A is behind. I, I think they've acknowledged 18A is behind. And so for them, it's really can they make 14A competitive? And uh, again, that's, that's four or five years from now that we're going to find that out. So then at this juncture, what do you regard as Intel's most crucial strategic priorities? At this point, for Intel, it's, it's, it's again, it's two things. It, it's one. Um, we have to get our chip design where our competitors are, right? No matter how good or bad their, their manufacturing is, if you can't compete, whether it's on your own process or whether it's on TSM's process, then you're going to have a hard time succeeding in business. Um, secondly, though, it's, it's get their fabs right. So uh, being behind on the manufacturing side is really what stress them in the first place. And it's a huge advantage for them if they can use their own fab, not to pay a TSM, TSM a premium uh, for manufacturing um, and, and produce product. Uh, but with both those things, again, uh, it, it'll take time uh, before we, we see whether or not they're successful. Judging, looking at their recent earnings surprise, can we see this as a signal of a potential memory super cycle? Historically, w what you would see is demand would pick up supply just wouldn't be there. And it takes two years to build a fab. Uh, so you would get these, these elongated cycles where then finally supply would come on and, and we go into a down cycle. I, I think right now for the first time in, in a long time, we're at a point where supply hasn't been added and there is substantial demand uh, driven by AI but also driven by standard compute. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that it's going to be hard for the, the memory vendors to produce enough output given the demand for HBM for AI, given the demand for uh, RDMs for servers, uh, given the demand for more storage, particularly with the hard drive vendors uh, struggling to, to provide enough capacity as well. Following the earnings surprise, uh, Micron has, showed the high, has shown the high confidence on HBM4. My question is, um, when it comes to the uh, hardware architecture, uh, first, Micron is not using the Logic Die, nor they're using uh, D1C, which is Samsung is using at the moment. How do you think the Micron can achieve the, such kind of performance? The process, I, I think, matters less. So um, Micron and I believe Hynix are both using the, the, the 1B process. 
Um, if you can, if you have good yields, if you understand the process, uh, if you're creating good product, I, I think you're going to be competitive. Um, in, in terms of the logic diet, there certainly had been questions around um, could Micron get the same performance that Samsung's getting using uh, logic diet that they're manufacturing internally on logic processes or that uh, Hynix is getting through TSM uh, using their 10 nanometer process uh, on a on a memory process. I don't know anything more than what Micron management has said. I'm going to assume that yes, they really can do uh, 11 gigs per second, and, and if they can, that puts them well above spec and puts them in a very competitive position. Um, so now we'd like to move on to, I think, a company that everyone's very interested in. Uh, I'd like to ask you about NVIDIA. So until now, NVIDIA's main uh, core business has always been GPUs, but with their recent investment into OpenAI, Intel, and the UK AI startup ecosystem, uh, should we start viewing them as transitioning into a capital provider? NVIDIA, for the last four years, has been investing in the AI ecosystem outside of, invest, uh, outside, outside of NVIDIA. They've been a long-term investor in CoreWeave. Uh, they've invested in Perplexity. Uh, they have an investment in XAI. Difference now is really the scale funding that they are providing to OpenAI. And that's led to questions around, if you're going to give OpenAI that much money and they're going to go effectively spend it to buy NVIDIA equipment, you, you know, are you funding your own business? Um, I would be more concerned w with that if we weren't also seeing significantly more spending from the cloud service providers who've been the, the primary uh, customers for I NVIDIA. Um, we are seeing sovereign dollars show up that, that, that aren't coming from NVIDIA. So I, I think there's, there's a number of, of different uh, avenues where NVIDIA is seeing an increase in, in revenue. And, and if this isn't driving their business, I, I'm less concerned that uh, effectively they're buying their own products. With the potential emergence of physical AI, do you see this complementing NVIDIA's current position in software AI and possibly driving up exponential growth in, in its market share? The robots are an interesting application. Uh, I, I think that uh, potentially they're, they're, they're a little bit away, but I, I mean, having said that, you look at something like, like self-driving cars, uh, again, uh, maybe a, a, a little bit in the future, but but certainly, if you have these these solutions, um, they are creating efficiencies where effectively don't need human labor. Um, and, and so I, I think eventually, yes, they, they, they drive a ton of demand for for AI. Having said that, I think before we, we get to that point, you're going to see all these generative AI applications show up um, that are uh, positioned either for businesses, for the consumer, uh, that, that are replacing uh, kind of things like content creation. And I think that's the, that, that's the primary driver over the next couple of years, and then we'll, we'll see where we end up. Understood. Uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you for your idea. Uh, what's your outlook on NVIDIA's uh, business in China, uh, uh, given the current and future potential future regulatory environment? All analysts have pretty much taken any uh, revenues from China out of I NVIDIA's uh, income statement uh, in their estimates. I also think that looking forward that there is the potential that China uh, again allows NVIDIA chips in. I, I think in, in particular um, NVIDIA has some advantages uh, around the product that it can make because it, it can leverage TSM and so even if it's not the most advanced chips access to TM's, TSM's technology, the, the CUDA software, it gives them some real advantages. And, and again, I think looking at what they're doing w with Intel, that gives the US a reason to step up to bat and, and support I NVIDIA's ambitions. And so I, I think there's potential for them to get revenue from China. I, I think it's, it's a political solution at this point and, and a little bit out of NVIDIA's hands, but they've set themselves in, in, up in the, in the best uh, position possible to potentially uh, get back in, uh, again, given how they're working in other ways for, uh, the, to, to support the U.S. government. Then looking at it in a different perspective other than uh, the Chinese uh, regulations, um, 
considering the recent uh, price fluctuations, do you believe that the expectations for growth in the AI and HPC markets have been fully priced into NVIDIA stocks, or is there still a further upside for Left. I think that what we saw at the beginning of September was a realization that there, there seems to be an, an increase in demand. I think to some extent that, that explains what we were seeing uh, stock-wise, but it has the, the potential for AI been, been fully priced in? Uh, I, I don't think so. Looking forward, uh, I, I think that the reality is NVIDIA very well could see 40, 50, 60 percent growth next year. Um, it's always it's always hard to get the exact number there, but CSP uh, demand again appears to be accelerating. Uh, you have neo clouds growing at a faster rate. Uh, you have all this sovereign investment. Uh, and now it, it does look like, in part, that, that, that CSP incremental investment is being driven by uh, inference use cases. And, and so when you get this shift from training to inference, I, I think it, it drives more revenue opportunity. And at the end of the day, what we don't know is exactly how much more productivity are these solutions going to drive. And the more productivity we see, the, the, the more gains that for NVIDIA uh, because the more GPUs we're going to need to support that AI that's driving uh, productivity. Uh, with multiple uh, founders expected to, such as Intel and Samsung, expected to enter uh, two nanometers uh, market race, do you think uh, the TSMC, do you expect TSMC to maintain their, their market share in this segment? If so, what's so special about them compared to other competitors? With TSMC, they, they've done it, right? They, they, did. They, they did it with seven, they did it with five, they did it with three. And I, I think at this point, if you are looking at, at a two nanometer solution and you want to be confident that you're going to get a product that, that has good yields, uh, that has good performance, uh, you're, you're, you're choosing Taiwan Semi. Um, with Intel, uh, I think management has been very open about the fact that 18A wasn't where they wanted it to be. Um, I, I think they're, in terms of uh, Looking at foundry business, um, they're really shooting for 14A, but that's uh, the 2028, 20, 2029, 20, 2030 time frame. And, and so we're talking, you know, four or five years away. Um, with, with Samsung, uh, they have one big customer, uh, it sounds like, in, in Tesla. Uh, you, you never know exactly what someone had to give up to get that, that business. Um, my impression is that Tesla is getting a lot of benefits, and if it works out, um, it's great for Tesla, it's great for Samsung, uh, but I, I think at this point it, it's going to be a struggle for anyone to displace TSM at, at 2 nanometer. You're looking further down the road. Then what are your perspectives on the geopolitical risk for TSMC? Because uh, especially considering that Warren Buffett has recently raised similar concerns about that. Mm -hmm. Econ major, uh, <laughs> not, not I, I, don't, I don't know geopolitics. Ha having said that, my impression with China is that they play a long game. Um, so if you move back not that long ago, uh, the Conservative Party was, was in Taiwan was close to winning elections. Um, I, I think it would be a much easier transition for China if uh, the Taiwanese, Taiwanese people uh, move more in favor of China as opposed to, uh, you know, trying to do something that, that's more aggressive. Um, and then you, you look right now, right, I mean, you could argue the greater geopolitical risk is, is the U.S. We've got... Uh, rumors or speculation that uh, the U.S. is going to institute uh, new tariffs that require one-to-one uh, -one, um, ratio of imports uh, versus domestic production, right? With, with TSM, they, they have uh, they have uh, their new facilities in in Arizona, um, but one-to-one's a, a big ask, um, and, and so you, you could argue that U.S. policy, if anything. Um, is pushing Taiwan to be closer to China. Um, I, I just, I, I, it's, it's low on my list of things I worry about. Another question about AMD. I'm just curious, uh, since like AI GPUs, they rely heavily on large data, uh, data sets, and in the AI market in general prefer com uh, favors company with uh, advantages in data in a very, very early stage. Uh, what are your perspectives on AMD entering into this market? When you think about AI silicon, you've got two choices. You've got GPUs and you've got custom ASICs. 
Um, the, the great things about the great thing about GPUs is they're really flexible. They run projects in parallel. That's great for AI, but then you're running everything on software. So as your application changes, you're able to change that software. And when you think about the kind of the history of GPUs, you've had two companies there, NVIDIA and AMD. Right now, NVIDIA has the lion's share of the data center GPU market. Um, I, I think there is a desire uh, among uh, AI customers to have choices. That creates opportunity for AMD, um, and it's up to AMD to execute on uh, their, their product roadmap to, to take advantage of that. I don't think they're, they're at a disadvantage in terms of being the second player. I, I think the struggle for AMD is NVIDIA is pushing uh, the, the bar in terms of how good their technology is at, at a rate that we haven't seen historically, and that makes it really hard for competition to, to keep up. That AMD's biggest struggle is, is simply going to be can we keep abreast of what in, of what Nvidia is doing, um, and and remain competitive, and so thereby gain share? So we're going to have our last question on HBM. Um, I understand that HBM has been playing a central role in a, in AI chips, and also uh, and the market has always played in that way with the increasing use of non HBM. Uh, do you think the HBM can still continue to maintain the dominant market share? I mean, a lot depends on I Nvidia. Right. So as long as NVIDIA keeps on designing HBM into uh, its GPU structure, then, then HBM is going to ma maintain a really important role. I, I mean, to a lesser extent, uh, you have the same uh, the setup with, with, with Broadcom uh, and the CSPs, with Broadcom being the most uh, successful of uh, the custom ASIC vendors. Uh, but uh, the reason HBM is the dominant choice is it offers the highest density and the most bandwidth. Um, whether it's AI or whether it's, it's data center compute, uh, memory is a bottleneck. And, and so in order to displace HBM, I, I think you need other solutions that are able to supply uh, competitive, uh, competitive characteristics in terms of performance. And I, as of right now, I, I, I don't know of one. I, I think where you're seeing kind of new memories get more traction, things like low power uh, DDR for, for servers, um, it, it's different use cases. Um, and so will there be other applications where memory uh, is, is able to uh, gain, gain traction? Yes. Um, do I see anything out there that's dis displacing HBM in, in the near term? It, at least it, it's not something that's, that's crossed my radar screen. I see, understood. Uh, well, thank you, Matt, so much. Uh, it's always good to have you on HANA channel. Um, and thank you for sharing your very fruitful ideas to our audience. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 네, 오늘의 이야기가 유익한 통찰을 제공했기를 바랍니다. 함께 해주신 전종우 사원님, 감사합니다. 그럼 다 함께 인사할까요? Shall we say it, gentlemen? HANA friends. 안녕. 안녕. 안녕.